I know for myself as growing up, I don't know if it's because it was an immigrant, but I was never taught about, uh, my parents never had the conversation about, you know, the driving, you know, you know being pulled aside, we have to do, we just, that wasn't a conversation. That wasn't a part of our, you know, our universe that we were like, at that point, I guess, what, there weren't the cell phone re video recordings of all this all the time. Um, there were certain things that we just didn't learn because I wasn't. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. And today with Africa Roundtables, we have a real treat, the amazing new movie, Farewell Amour. We're talking with the leads and the creative team responsible for this award-winning film. And we're looking forward to it. Uh, starting from my left with Brandon Avery, who this is his first time joining us, uh, who's in Dallas, Texas. And we are good to go. I will see you guys on the other side. Enjoy. How you all doing? Uh, my name is Brandon Avery with uh, Just My Opinion Reviews in Dallas. I uh, want to thank all of you for being here. I really do appreciate it. And um, also, congratulations on this whole film, Equa, uh, and all the awards. And I, I love the film. I thought the performances were great across the board. Um, but something that really stood out to me in the middle of the film, in Tare, there was a line of dialogue that you delivered to your daughter, uh, Sylvia, saying that in this country, in America, for Black people, it can be really difficult, um, especially for foreigners. And they're how we Black people uh, often have to go around and carry ourselves in a way that's not threatening to white people. Um, I, I think that we can all relate to, you know, to, the, to that in some form or fashion. So my question is not just to you and Tyra, to all of you, um, whoever wants to answer. Throughout your whole filmography and television and films, you know, all, all you guys' filmography is very diverse. Do you find yourself in Hollywood on these TV shows and movies to where you still constantly have to walk on eggshells? around white people and not come across threatening? And if so, like, what are some ways if you can possibly talk about how you overcome that? I recently graduated from a predominantly white institution. So I, even though I'm fairly new to the industry, I have been pre-exposed to uh, whiteness. Um, so having to navigate that was tricky, especially because I got into school when I was 17 and you know, I'm still finding myself. And I came from a, a predominantly black high school, performing arts high school, Duke Ellington in DC. And so making that transition was kind of jarring, right? And how do I navigate my body in space as uh, one of two black women in my group, right? Uh, how do I, where there's not many allies. How do you uh, create your own safe space? How do you protect yourself, but yet also be vulnerable enough in your artistry to grow, to stretch, to share? Um, and, and I've learned that it's actually more daring my colleagues to be uncomfortable, daring them to just deal with me in my, in my totality. Um, and like, confront their own opinions. Like if that scares you, then okay, be scared and then get over that and deal with it. Um, Love uh, that. And I, I, well, I, and I found that actually by not tiptoeing so much, one, I'm not bound and I'm not having to deal with so much internal monologues on a daily basis. But then two, it that challenge to my white counterparts is actually um, helpful for both of us. Right, we're getting past all the guck and like getting just down to the realities of situations, and it's it's profited more conversations now, um, and giving me the courage to speak up and speak up for what I care about, and and really be an advocate in, in the audition rooms, in the meetings with producers, like just not trying to play the game anymore. I think enough amazing people have come before me who have played that game so that I don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. And coming into that era right now, it's, it's quite refreshing. Um, it's scary, but it's, it is refreshing to be like, okay, that's the torch that's being passed right now. That's the charge that's happening right now. Um, yeah, that's my little two cents on that. 
Well, I think just, sorry, Brandon, just to, to chime in, um, that moment in the movie is, I think he's also the moment where he's encouraging her, trying to give her the wings to fly. And it's in reference to that dance competition. Uh, um, and I think what's so great, um, which the film doesn't really, you know, because it's, it's an insular story about this family and it's, we don't really deal with the greater ramifications of being, you know, of race, I don't think until that, that particular moment really. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gekwa. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so I think that moment really was just like sort of tipping a hat to the bigger world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. uh, but not nail, it's not like a nailing it on the head kind of thing, but just like, and it's done with, I think the same way like my parent does did. I think it's different from an immigrant's, is it like to get the difference between an immigrant's way of trying to tell this, tell this the narrative of being in a, a minority in a, in a white world and the African-American. I think there's a difference. Uh, and I think for myself, the one thing that is across the board for both worlds is that you have to be better. Mm -hmm. I think regardless of whether you're an immigrant or you're an African-American first generation or you've been in your generations, it's like, you have to be 10 times better. Or right. my dad, you have to be 10 times better than them. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so at that point, that's what happens. But I think there's a difference. I know for myself as growing up, I don't know if it's because I was an immigrant, but I was never taught about, uh, my parents never had the conversation about, you know, the driving, you know, you know being pulled aside, we have to do. We just, that wasn't a conversation. That wasn't a part of our, you know, our universe that we were like, at that point, I guess, what, there weren't the cell phone rec video recordings of all this all the time. Um, there were certain things that we just didn't learn because I wasn't, my parents weren't from this country. Uh, so there's certain things that are missed in translation when you're trying to bring up your kid in this world that you just don't know about. Right. Um, so I think that's I think that's what Equa did in that point, where she's pointing out that this there's this issue, this wider world that you're living in, but it doesn't go into like all the atrocities. Right. But it just says, look, you are better than you are. You are the, the brightest shining star. You have a long history and don't let anything hold you back. You know, just go right. and sail. Yeah. And, you know, it could have been a different story. <laughs> you know? But I think that's what's so beautiful about the way she did it. And I think that's, a, you know, I'm just repeating myself in terms of the, I saw Zaina nodding her head, maybe she can chime in about how that as an immigrant that you hear these, you know, a different sort of perspective sometimes. Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, like you said, for me, hi, um, thinking about what you're saying, the it's a particularly female point of view too that Equa wrote because we I grew up in London from a Sierra from a in a Sierra Leonean family immigrant family and we we did we also got the conversation you have to be better than them or, or mainly you're going to be a doctor whether you like it or not that is what you're <laughs> going to do you have no decision no choice in this but we never got those that particular conversation that particular talk that you get here and specifically because I come from a family of girls. I'm like one of five girls. So it's a different conversation I think you would have with a, with your female children, you, you know, you know, your girl children than you would with your boy children, I think. And that's a, and it's, Echo has written it from a particularly um, a, a woman's point of view speaking to a girl. You know, I wonder, I'm sure it would be a different conversation had Sylvia been Silvio. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know what I mean? It would have been a different conversation because I, 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 and so like you were saying, I also coming here to this country and even living in England, there are certain nuances in the conversations that people have with their children growing up and navigating the space that I missed and to this day still missed. Mm -hmm. And you know, little things that, like this has, this maybe not have, any, have anything to do with what we're saying, but I was just listening to the Colson Whitehead book the other day called Sag Harbor. Mm. I have lived in this country over 15 years and there's a section where he talks about W.D. Du Bois 
That was mm -hmm. the first time I've heard it pronounced that way because in my mind, all my life, I've always said Dubois. And it was literally two days ago, I was walking down the street and I'm like, wait, it's Dubois? <laughs> and the chapter dealt with not admitting that you don't know something because he was as a child growing up, his parents would mention these people and he'd say, who are they? And they'd look at him like, how do you not know these people? How do you not know these nuances, these, these historical things, these layers? Right. Of who we are and how we move through this country and you, and you're from here and I and it's the same thing that continues to happen with me personally and I would say that particular moment is like I love that Walter is trying so hard to say there are things you just don't know because I probably don't know either <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean but I'm just saying it's different it, just be careful be aware of that mm. you know okay. Thank you all. I, I really do appreciate it. and congratulations again. And, and Jamie, I look forward to the Batman. Hey, yes. Hey. <laughs> well, you know, we can't thank you enough for participating today in our round table. Uh, on behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, we'd like to thank you. Know that we will continue to watch you and support you in whatever you're doing. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we'll see you for another edition of Africa Roundtables. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I had a great time talking with the cast. And if you would like to see the film Farewell or More, you can in theaters and online on video on demand on December the 11th. And I want to thank the African American Film Critics Association for putting this together. If you would like to see the full roundtable interview, there's a link down to it in the description box and the pinned comments. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Please subscribe to my channel. Follow me on social media. And before you go, don't forget that my name is Brandon Keith Avery, and that's just my opinion. Peace. bringing us together. Welcome. It's not his fault that we had to wait so many years. Why didn't he come back home then? Why are you here? Just one dance. We don't know each other anymore. We lost so many years. So, what do we do now? This country is very hard. have to carry yourself a certain way. <laughs> You're the only one who knows what you know and who can do what you do.